Proudly we hail. From New York City, where the American stage begins, here is another program with a cast of outstanding players. Public service time has been made available by this station for your Army and your Air Force to bring you this story, as proudly we hail Rufus Putnam. Our story is entitled, The Father of Ohio, a story of Rufus Putnam, who, long before he organized the first permanent settlement in the Buckeye State, had secured a firm place in American history. Our first act curtain will rise in just a moment, but first... Today, your rapidly expanding United States Army needs intelligent young men with ability and ambition. Men intelligent enough to recognize the vital need for a strong armed force. Men with ability enough to be trained in a necessary job. Men with ambition enough to secure the future for themselves and their loved ones. Does this description fit you? Can you qualify? For full information on how you can fit in with the finest, check with your nearest United States Army and United States Air Force recruiting station now. And now your Army and your Air Force present the proudly we hail production, The Father of Ohio. Sadler's Inn is gone, and the dirt track that was once the road to Boston Town is now a great modern highway. The road isn't important except for the fact that it ran smack past the inn. And during that long gone year of 1748, the inn was well frequented by travelers riding both east and west. And so it was that Captain Sadler's stepson, young Rufus Putnam, had a chance to meet and talk to and get to know a great many folks. Whoa. Oh, boy. Uh, this Sadler's Inn? Yes, sir. Uh, are you full up, boy? No, sir. There's room for both you and your horse. Uh, are you the stable boy? That and a lot more besides, sir. Captain Sadler is my stepfather. Uh, keeps you on the run, eh? Oh, he's very kind to me, sir. I, I didn't mean... Oh, of course you didn't. Before I left Albany, I was told to keep an eye open for this spot. They also told me there was a young fella here who was learning to read. Be you he? Yes, sir. Good, good. I thought so. Now, before you see to my horse, uh, here's something I brought you. You can keep it overnight. A book? Robinson Crusoe. Oh, sir, thank you. <laughs> I don't know if you can read it all in one night. You see, I must take it with me when I leave tomorrow. Birthday present for my grandson in Boston. Well, what's the matter? If I read all night, I'll burn a whole candle and... Oh, I know, I know. Candles are hard to come by. Well, I have an extra one here. You can take... Well, now what's the matter? Sir, if you'll excuse my question, why all this for me? Well, I know of no other boy in this whole territory with the ambition to teach himself to read. It's important, lad. It's important for people to help young strong. Ain't you to bed yet? If you are, put out that candle. I told you for not to waste wax. I'm almost undressed. I'm just pulling off my boots. Hear that? Just one more to go. Hey, Rufus! Rufus, what was that? The candle? I can't see the light through the cracks. Rufus, did you knock the candle over? I'm coming up. Yes, sir, I did, but everything's all right now. Nothing caught fire. Well, we don't know whether Rufus got to finish Robinson Crusoe at that reading, but we do know that Rufus went to live with his sister Hulda and her husband Daniel in North Brookfield. Dan was a millwright, and Rufus became his apprentice, but in between times he read everything he could lay his hands on, from geometry to the Bible. Ruf, it appears to me it's time we had to talk. What about, Dan? 
About you. What about me? Well, you're already a full-fledged apprentice millwright. It won't be long before you're a journeyman. I suppose you like being a millwright, but well, then we ain't never talked none about what you got in your mind to do. Dan, you've been both a father and a brother to me, and it just isn't anything I can ever do to repay you and hold up. But, Dan, I, I'm not going to be a millwright. No? Well, what are you going to be, then? An engineer. An engineer? Build mm -hmm. bridges, roads, that sort of thing? That sort of thing, Dan. Hmm. You know what I think? <laughs> you think I'm crazy? No, no. No, I think you'll make a good engineer. It took Rufus a few years before he got down to the business of engineering. For just about that time, along came an unpleasant little fracas called the French and Indian War. Rufus was young, he had a keen eye, did middling well with a musket, and his long legs were built for travel. So he joined up, and it wasn't long before his youth, his keen eye, his musket, and his legs were all being put to good use up around Lake Champlain, where some of General Montcalm's Indian allies were out collecting scalps for the glory of New France. Try to reload as you run, Gabe. The woods is full of them. I think they were as surprised as we were. How are we going to get back to camp? We'll have to circle. Wait, wait, hold up here for, for a minute. They don't seem to be following. They ain't like them. They chase everything that moves. Yell like wild dogs. Check your priming, Gabe. I think we'd better keep moving fast, Roof. I've seen at least six of the devils. Look, if you stood on that rock there and you jumped hard, you could catch on to the bottom limb of that big pine. And I got a notion that's what we better do right smartly. Go up the tree and hide? Yeah. I think it'd be a sight more sensible to make tracks. Wait, listen. Huh? That was from up ahead. That war party we almost stepped on let us go because they knew we'd run straight into the arms of the whole tribe. Up that tree and quick, it's our only chance. Roof, I had never seen that many engines. Must have been over 400 of them. Come down from Canada. We gotta get back to the fort quick as we can, Gabe. With them between us and it? You tell me how. We'll have to go down the lake. Well, I'm fair enough in the water, but I ain't no fish. How do you expect to travel nigh under 20 miles without a boat? We've got to build one. Just like that, eh? What are you figuring on using for tools? we got our knives. How long do you expect it'll take? About a month? We'll build a raft. Use logs from fallen trees. We'll lash them together with vines. Then we'll make a kind of a sail out of our shirts. The wind's blowing down the lake. It'll help us. Hmm. Tell me something. You ever build a raft before? Nope. But I want to build me one now. So let's get down out of this tree. We've got to reach the fort ahead of that war party, or the chances are there won't be any fort. No, that don't beat him. Keep your voice down. Make sure that end log there is lashed tight. Prettiest raft I ever see. Roof, you ruined it. Never mind that now. The light's half gone and we're still here. Hold that steady there. Yeah. Wind's rising. That should help. Well, we haven't time to do any more. This will have to do. All right, now let's push her out. You'll have to hold the sail mast. She won't stay up by herself. I'll steer. When you're tired, we'll switch. Sailed on a lot of boats in my time, Roof. But this one sure takes the king's breeches. Whether Roof's makeshift vessel took the king's britches or not is a moot question, but it did carry him and Gabe down Lake Champlain well past the Indian encampment before wind and water broke it up. Its two passengers swimming to shore ran a fast five miles uphill and down dale before breakfast to warn the fort of unfriendly visitors on the way. As a result of this unorthodox and inspired piece of engineering, the Indians were greeted in a somewhat noisy manner. I think we ought to get a medal for this. Keep your head down or you get a pine box. <laughs> hey, listen to him holler. Watch me get that one. Good shot. That ain't the one I was aiming at, but I guess it don't rightly matter. Roof, you sure you ain't never built a raft before? Uh, nope. Ah. Hit anything? 
No, I don't think so. I swear, Roof, if you never built a raft before, how did you know how to build that one last night? Hmm? In the dark, nothing but knife. He and... <laughs> ate the limb of that tree down there. This gun don't shoot very straight. <laughs> how did you know how to do it, Roof? Oh, I read a book once about a fellow named Robinson Crusoe. Read some other books, too. They all helped me. And me wanting to be an engineer. Well, I just engineered it. That's all. Where'd that one go? I think I hit your limb. <laughs> your gun don't shoot me straight in mine. Yeah. Hell pays like them red devils have had a belly full anyway. As long as I live, I'll never forget. When Rufus Putnam got out of the army, he went back home to Massachusetts and did a remarkable thing. He fell in love. It was a type of engineering he wasn't exactly up on, and like so many others who have come before and after him, the condition made him most articulate. Uh, I... Uh, yes, uh, Rufus? I, uh, that is... Uh, well... Uh, is something uh, wrong, Rufus? Oh, no, 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 nothing at all. It's, well, I, I just... You, uh, just what, Rufus? Persis, hmm? I want to ask you... Uh, that is, I, I, I mean, I, I want to tell you that... I mean... That... <laughs> you mean you're all mixed up. Yeah. I mean, no, 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 I'm not mixed up. It's, if you I... have something you want to tell me, Rufus, you'd better do so. Pa will be back soon. Yes, I, I, I know, I, I know, I... <laughs> What's so all fired funny? <laughs> What's so all fired funny? Uh, you. Cat got your tongue. Cat got my tongue, huh? Come here, oh, mistress. Please, Rufus, no, you... Oh, oh Rufus. Persis, will you marry me? Of course, silly. <laughs> And so Rufus married his Persis, thus engineering his way into the realm of matrimony, which was blessed in due course with several additional Putnams. Meanwhile, he was establishing a reputation throughout the colony as a builder and planner of everything from roads to dams. Rufus was on his way up, and by the time he reached his 37th year, he was considered a successful and respected member of his community. But then, his community, as all communities in the 13 colonies, were suddenly engulfed in the earth-shaking events of their time. April, 1775. I'll have to go with the others to Boston, Persis. I know. Well, I must offer my services. You understand that. Oh, of course, my dear. Do you... Do you think this actually means a war? I don't know, my dear. Perhaps it can be settled peaceably. Perhaps calmer minds will prevail. But if not, then we're committed to it. And we must continue until we've won. You are listening to the proudly we hailed production of The Father of Ohio. We'll return to our story in just a moment. Young man, let's talk about your future and America's future. They're important to each other, you know. Today, your United States Army is charged with a vital responsibility. You need only to glance at your local newspaper to realize how vital. And to meet this responsibility, the Army is rapidly expanding its forces. They have a job for you, a job that must be done by men of courage. You can get full details of how you may best serve your future and your country's future by a visit to your nearest United States Army and United States Air Force recruiting station today. You are listening to Proudly We Hail, and now we present the second act of The Father of Ohio. Rufus Putnam's hope that calmer minds might prevail did not bear fruit. This was not a time of calmness. It was a time for action, a time for revolution, a time to throw off old yokes and hold high the new bright torch of liberty. Rufus became a colonel in charge of Washington's budding engineer corps in that ragged bobtail army 
as it lay siege to Lord Howe's finest in Boston town. Come in. Colonel Putnam is here to see you. Now send him right in, Captain. Yes, sir. Colonel, General Washington will see you now. Thank you. Uh, sit down, Colonel Putnam. How have you been? Fine, sir. Good. I was inspecting Brookline Fort yesterday, and I noticed the improvements you made there. Excellent piece of work. Thank you, sir. However, I didn't ask you to come here to talk fortifications. Last night, the cannons we took at Ticonderoga finally got here, 20 of them. That's good news, Oh, wait till you hear the rest. They arrived without shot. Unfortunately, what shot we do have is too small for their use. So unless we can lay our hands on cannonballs of the correct caliber, these guns and the Herculean effort of dragging them across two colonies will have been for naught. What size shot do we need, sir? They're all 20-pounders. Now... If we could put them into service, added to what we already have, I'm convinced we'd see the Britishers evacuating Boston. Now, I know ordnance is not your department, but since you seem to be a master at improvisation... Uh, uh, I'll have to give it some thought, sir. We have no means of manufacturing shot here, and I don't think any of the mills to the south make shot that big. I know that, Colonel. It seems only the redcoats are well supplied with it. Yes, they... Sir... They're big frigates. They carry 20-pounders, don't they? I believe so. You, you have something in mind? Well, it just came to me that since they have the cannonballs we need, perhaps we can get them to give us some. But how do you propose to accomplish that, Colonel? Well, suppose when the Britishers wake up tomorrow morning, they see a brand-new fort staring at them across Dorchester Flats. Chances are they'd send out one of the big ships of the line to get rid of it. Now, the sand is soft along the flats. And the shot they'd use shouldn't be too badly damaged. <laughs> you know, it might work. I'll give it a try if you say so, sir. I say so by all means. Rufus' plan worked so well that when the British ship Somerset finally put out to sea, the fort was completely demolished and the sand was littered with hundreds of cannonballs. Uh, Second hand, but almost as good as new. Later, they were returned to the British from the fortifications on Dorchester Heights that Rufus had built. Through the long, hard years of war that followed, Rufus was on hand to build and to fight wherever he was needed. He did a great deal of both, and when it was all over, he was no longer Colonel Putnam, but General Putnam, anxious to get home to his wife and family. Well, uh, you, you better tell her, Rufus. Tell me what, Gabe? Oh, there you are, my dear. Never mind that. What have you got to tell me? Well, Gabe just informed me that the petition we put into Congress to buy land in Ohio has been approved. And how does that affect us? Well, you know, my name was on that petition. But that doesn't mean you're forced to go. Well, uh, we want him to head up the first party that goes out, be in charge of setting up homes. Uh, I see. Uh, Gabe, maybe you better drop in later. Sure. Evening, ma'am. Mm. You'd, uh, leave us here? Only until we had things settled. You've been away so much, Ruth. Can't we settle here? But it's new out there, darling. Brand new. There'll be so much to build, so much to do. And I want to be a part of it, Persis. I'm being silly. I, I know you do. I know you should. We'll wait for you. We've waited before, but this time the waiting won't be so bad because we'll know you're coming back to us. Now stop looking so solemn and give me a kiss. <laughs> Gentlemen, if our first group of wagons leave Danvers about December 10th and joins the second group leaving Hartford, Connecticut on New Year's Day, I think we can reach the Ohio lands by April 1st. That is, barring any big blizzards and major accidents on route. Uh, Rufus, will we take the northern route or go by Braddock's Road through Pennsylvania? Well, the route through Pennsylvania will be the easier. And we may be able to put our wagons and supplies on river rafts to reach the Ohio. Sounds like a pretty good idea to me. I... I caution you all to bear in mind that the trip will be very difficult. We may meet unfriendly Indians. And we'll not take any women and children this time. Hold those wagons in the rear! 
All of you men, come up come front on. and help us with this one. All right, once more, all together. Any Here more wagons go. bogged down in this deep snow, we'll have to make sleds and carry the wheels. Oh, it's no use, men. All four wheels are down in the snow to the axles. Even the horses can't make much headway fighting this. All right, all right, hold it. Looks as if we camp here for a day or so and then turn our wagons into sleds. Cargo wagons are carrying enough sled runners for all. We'll make it all right, Gabe. I didn't expect the snows to be so deep so soon. At least we're prepared for that. However, it's good to know that those who come after us will find this trail well broken. Roof, do you still plan to put everything on boats when we get to the river? Yes. We're bound to do better on the river than going overland and fighting deep snows. First of April tomorrow, Roop. We should be on our way by then. Sure took longer to build these boats than it took to build that raft on Champlain, huh? For all we've accomplished, six weeks isn't bad. Yeah, General, this river mist may spell trouble. How do we see the shore now? How are we going to stay in the channel? We have no idea where it is. We'll have to take that chance. Every once in a while, you can see the top of a high tree through this low-hanging mist. It may tell us something about where we are. Yeah. Ahoy there! Can you hear me back there? Ahoy there! Keep as close to the right bank as you can and still stay in the channel. If you have to beach your boat, take the river bank on the right. It should be close to our turnoff point, Gabe. With all this land, fog, and river mist, how can you tell? You listen to me. Hmm? Hold, men, hold your sticks. Hold Hear that? Hear what? That music must be at Fort Harbor. Our turnoff point is just before the fort. Men on the right, drag your pole. Men on the left, dig deeper. This is our turn. Roof, current's too strong. We're not turning enough to make it into the muslin. It's being carried on past the fort. Well, if we can't turn, I don't think the others can either. Well, that fog is lifting just a little. We're going right on past the fort. Look at them soldiers on the banks. They're waving to us. Waving to us? Hey, they're not waving, Gabe. They're trying to toss ropes to us. Grab those ropes! Rufus Putnam and his rafts and flat-bottom boats were stopped from being carried past their goal. As each craft was slowed down and halted, it was turned around with the help of the strong ropes held securely by the soldiers on shore. The expedition landed on the banks of the Muskingum River, where it joins the Ohio on April 8, 1788. Thank you, gentlemen, for your birthday wishes, but there's work to be done. It's birthday present enough for me just being here and knowing that soon we'll have our homes built and our families with us. Well, General, uh, what are we going to name our settlement? Well, Colonel, I'd like to name this settlement after a lady, Mm -hmm. a queen, a woman who helped America win its war of independence. If the men don't like the name, we can change it later, but for now... Let's call our village Marietta, in honor of Marie Antoinette of France. This is the day the Lord hath made. Let us bow down and worship and, well... What's the meaning of this? Reverend, a scout just came in. He says the tribes are up. They're on the warpath. You men will want to leave. I will see the women and children get safely home. Bring buckets of clay from the riverbank. You others, bring tubs of water. I think we can stop. Why the clay and water, General? We can make mud. And if it'll stay on the roofs, the flaming arrows won't set fire to our building. 
We'll work all night long if we have to. Perhaps we won't be attacked, but we'll be ready just in case. The Indians did not attack that night or any other night, but the village of Marietta and Rufus Putnam were always ready. The threat of Indian war was ever-present until President Washington sent General Anthony Wayne to take charge of the army in the West and prepare for any conflict. At the same time, Washington planned another important job for Putnam. Come in. Oh, it's you, Gabe. Bring your letter from President Washington. From President Washington? What's it say, Ruth? You have been appointed the first surveyor general of the United States. Oh. Your duties are en route. You will, however, begin surveying the entire Northwest area and so help our country to peacefully expand. Uh, you'll, uh, you'll be going away again. Oh, it's a very great honor, my dear. But if I'm going to be surveyor general, I must have a headquarters. Certainly I can't survey the entire Northwest Territory by myself. So I think you'll find me right here in Marietta most of the time. Do you believe him, Gabe? Nope. But he sure says it right smart. If anybody was to try and sum up Rufus Putnam's life and all that he accomplished in it, his own favorite quotation from the fifth chapter of Matthew might best do the trick. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel basket, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. Well, we hope we have shown you a few of the good works of Rufus Putnam, for he was one of many who lent his greatness to the building and heritage of our land. Rufus Putnam, patriot, soldier, builder, planner, whom proudly we hail. Here's a special message for the young men of our country. The United States Army, the senior service of our armed forces, is expanding rapidly and needs your help. By enlisting in the United States Army, you'll not only get the finest training in the world, but you'll have the special pride that goes with wearing a United States Army uniform. Why not get full details today? Visit your local United States Army and United States Air Force recruiting station. Enlist now. This has been another program on Proudly We Hail, presented transcribed in cooperation with this station. Proudly We Hail is produced by the Recruiting Publicity Bureau for the United States Army and United States Air Force Recruiting Service. This is Kenneth Banghart speaking and inviting you to tune in the same station next week for another interesting story on Proudly We Hail. <laughs>